Good afternoon. Welcome to Vancouver. My name's Martin Horville, and this is Jonas Vermeulen. I'm the Principal Solutions Architect for Australia New Zealand, and my colleague Jonas. I'm Product Line Manager for Nuage, covering Europe, Middle East, Africa. So we're presenting today on Nuage Network's enterprise-grade networking in OpenStack, or how, to, uh, how IT needs to deliver networking with high availability, scalability, interoperability across multi-site environments seamlessly with existing heterogeneous infrastructure and vendors, and interconnect private clouds with external private clouds too. That's really what we're talking about today. So as an introduction, I'd like to first uh, set the parameters around what we believe Enterprise wants, and we've gathered this from a lot of our customers. Essentially, driving the business is faster time to market, a lower cost and higher quality, reduced operational expenditure, and ubiquitous, easy to manage, maintain and consume technology. The technology that's driving this business change throughout the market is the trend of IT as a service, so self-service from a catalogue, on demand, an operational expenditure model for chargeback, pools of resources that can easily be adjusted. We see that with the, uh, the um, platform as a service type environments. Um, availability of integrated applications in shared environments, so even application platform as a service, and short cycle provisioning. So moving from longer cycle implementations to much shorter. The enterprise is complex. There's existing hardware, hypervisors, platforms, apps that can't be virtualized, as well as platforms such as mid-range systems, multiple data centers, remote branches, remote workers, the list goes on. It's a very complex environment. As well, pressure from the business to perform, hidden IT, Amazon workloads as an example, being pushed out by people in marketing, other areas of the business without central IT even knowing what's going on, add to that reporting compliance, and in many cases, a limited set of highly skilled staff to implement all this. What we see to enable all of this is essentially a simplification of this complexity. Scalability, abstraction, flexibility and extensibility we think are the key approaches to ensuring that we can deliver successfully to enterprises leveraging the new technology like OpenStack private clouds and hybrid cloud. This enables consumption to the enterprise. And consumption is what they're seeking, as I mentioned, IT as a service. This is really the complexity that we see in data centers. We need to eliminate that to enable consumption as a service. What OpenStack delivers to the enterprise? Faster turn up for the business, efficiency. It does minimize cost. We see that with examples like PayPal. DevOps, single set of APIs, enabling these short cycles across the business, not just within IT, but DevOps applications being implemented out in other divisions as well. An open ecosystem of vendors, freedom of choice, and much stronger enterpri enterprise support from vendors. We see this with some of the distros from Red Hat, Canonical, etc. Networking environments are highly complex. How do we manage those going forward with this new way of doing business and this new way of doing technology? We believe a policy-based approach to networking really is the key. Starting with policy templates on the left, where we can define them once and then use them many times across the organization like copy-paste in Word. We see uh, with some of the work we've been doing with other vendors with group-based policy, which is an open source project and part of the OpenStack um, project as well, a set of commonalities that we can define with that abstraction, users, application types, and business rules. And with this, it allows flexibility with simplicity within this complex environment. We can then apply those policies out to the environment, as I said, many times, in, in the same way that you would copy-paste. We also can introduce the complexities of those environments within the abstraction, such as 
three tier applications, external web servers, middleware, databases, all the rule sets, load balancing, firewall requirements, all set as a template. As I said, design once, use many times. Across the data center, uh, enterprises can then dis deploy these services in multiple data center environments across the WAN and also in different silos within the organization, whether they're using Zen, KVM, or ESXi hypervisor, and in fact, whether they're using OpenStack or CloudStack or vSphere. Within that complex environment, we have things like IP address management, DHCP, DNS, load balancing firewalls, new traffic flows of east-west, as well as the edge that needs to be secured. How do we do that? It's through this policy templating engine. We can define all of those capabilities and components within the template once and then apply many times. The enterprise environment can then be leveraging that ubiquitous platform uh, policy engine, excuse me, across all of their locations globally in multiple data centers, and as I mentioned, with different cloud platforms. We had uh, a presentation yesterday and a demo, and we've got another one this afternoon around this. This is one of our reference architectures that we actually have running using different cloud platforms. This one's within OpenStack, using different distributions of OpenStack, completely federated across the environment. So the themes that we're going to address and, and Jonas will continue on with are abstraction, scalability, flexibility, and extensibility. I'll hand over to Jonas. Thank you, Martin. So what we want to do in the remainder of the session is actually to go in more detail into each one of those more um, bigger themes and give you a few examples of what enterprises need or, and what technical challenges they have and how we can address some of that with OpenStack or with a combination of OpenStack and NUASH. For abstraction, that will actually mean how do you model your networks and how do you use a policy when you transition your application through a life cycle um, ranging from first development, where you do things in isolation, through to test and to enter Q&A, to production. And we're going to see how you can actually do the reuse, multiply, I mean, design once and reuse multiple times um, philosophy. Obviously, that brings us also to an aspect of scalability. I mean, when you design a cloud, you're actually going to see a lot of endpoints that has to be managed, that have to be government, governed under that policy. So the aspect of scalability is very important in the context of networking. Now, in flexibility, the example that we want to um, develop on is how do you connect this X as a service? whereby in an enterprise environment, you see this mixture of legacy firewalls, load balances that are non-virtualized. You see some innovation coming up there. They're virtualized. But sometimes they're also fully distributed. Right? How, does, how do you connect that all up? And what are the models that we see prevalent in an enterprise context? And finally, we want to talk a little bit about extensibility. Around how do you stretch your cloud from one side to multiple sites to also go to public sites? And it's actually building on the same philosophy as like the Keystone Federation, where you actually have one database or one source of identity. We're actually also going to look how can you do that from a networking point of view. Can you stretch your networks? Can you also maintain one source of policy where you're actually that you can apply across multiple clouds? deployments. So let us give a, get a start of how we enable abstraction and service velocity across these different environments. And I actually want to take a step back and here explain a little bit what we see how development environment look like. Typically, projects are done in a very isolated way. They're small project teams, they're developers, they're developing their application and they shouldn't harm anyone. They want to run even multiple versions of that, and they all just, um, they're here portrayed as little bubbles. They can all develop them in isolation without, um, contract, without any communication with something else. What it effectively means on the networking side is that once I develop my application, I actually want to extract my configuration, my network policy, 
and I want to use that later on. Otherwise, I have to redo it again later. I also see that uh, I will get a lot of distributed routers for this. Right? They don't have to be distributed, but I mean, typically we see that um, to make effective use of your infrastructure and to avoid that you have to do configuration or your hardware routers, you want to make them distributed. You want to make them fully um, in software, so don't have that dependency anymore of a centralized node or of a hardware router that does the particular routing for that developer instances. You also see that there is typically an overlap of IP space between them, because you run different versions of the software. Um, and well, basically, developer, you don't want to care about what particular IP space you're working in. I mean, you work anyway in isolation. Now, once you move then on to a test environment, you move away from that isolation. You're effectively working in an environment where all applications are bundled up or where they're in one bigger bubble. They can all communicate with each other. And so effectively, you still want to make use of that policy defined before and reuse that in your test environment. From a routing perspective, it also means that I'm moving away from a lot of small routers to actually a big very large distributed routing instance. And I will also move into an environment where I get a unique IP space. Because here I actually want to test my communication with monitoring tools, maybe with a centralized DNS or IPAM. I want to have authentication running. So there's a lot of shared infrastructure that I want to validate here in this test environment. And production essentially is just a copy of the previous. So think again. It's going to be very important to reapply that same policy. And the only difference really with test is just that the number of instances could be different. So when we then thought about, OK, how can you reuse policy um, in an, um, between those different environments, it's actually not so trivial anymore. Because your network infrastructure or your subnet schemes um, are going to be quite different between the two. Your IP addressing will be different. So you kind of have the choice what you're going to do. You either will have to modify your cookbooks, or you're going to have to modify your um, maybe scripts to deploy your application so that they know about the new IP addressing scheme. Or the alternative that we see is that um, you can use an external system to define your topology and enforce policies. So effectively, you're going to can use, or you can use group-based policy, or you can use another policy system that are going to apply to the environments or to the routers that are defined in OpenStack. So this is an approach that we have developed for a number of our customers. And essentially, here what you see is an example for a test environment. On the left side, you see how you model a full test environment from a networking perspective. It is this one distributed big router, one logical, that combines or makes sure that it connects up all the different projects. So it could be something like a B2C side, some consumer analysis project, stock application. And each one of those projects has its own policy around it. Yeah? The important thing is that all these projects can communicate with each other. And yet, they can still um, have their own policies, for instance, security groups to limit their east-west traffic flows. Tenants can see only their own subnets when you work it like that. So tenants, think about an OpenStack, they typically see their own routers, their own subnets. If I use a system like that, the only thing what I need to do is actually to map the subnets defined in this particular sub project, to map them in the tenant infra context of OpenStack. And as such, a particular tenant could see its developer subnets, could see its test subnets, and could see its production subnets. Yet the routing and policies are very segregated and um, defined in an independent way from each other. What I then effectively can do is, with my policy that I've developed or that I've fine-tuned in my developer instances, I can start 
pulling that out, I can start making an export of that. Um, I define my application per application. I can export it. I can maybe store it somewhere centralized. I can share it with others on GitHub. I can export it to another site. And then in the next phase of my application development, I can reapply it in my test environment. I merge it. I fine tune it. I can get approval, because that's still important in enterprise context, before it actually moves to production. So essentially, I'm going to get like a definition of a policy, a definition of my network structure about all the security rules that is very specific to an application and that I take from development through to test to production. There is no variation between those three environments. And it's always going to be um, a system that is going to check and enforce the policy itself. In this uh, example, you could also mimic those environments in other locations as well, so other data centers, etc. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the nice thing if you have a centralized catalog of your policy definition. They're managed by configuration management tools, the GitHub. And what we see is that you have a typically a centralized lab environment where your R&D is sitting for your software development. But the actual deployment of the application could happen in different parts and different data centers. And so they can take this one validated design and reapply it in multiple locations. In the meantime, you might think, how does that like, for instance, from a security perspective, how does this, such a policy actually look like? And this is, could be like an example of that, where I have two applications, my B2C site and my stock application, that each have their own policy around what ports need to be opened, what ports are allowed. And in my environment that combines all these applications together, I still want to have a single list of all of them together. Right? What I would expect or what we see that um, this, the network administrators then want is that there is still a capability to define a top policy list that defines all my infrastructure policies. And these infrastructure policies, they would allow to the, the network people or the operator people to always access, for instance, the VMs themselves. They would always, they always have to manage um, it via SSH or they always they want to make sure it's secure there, so they drop Telnet sessions. And so they always have to be applied regardless of how the application looks like inside. Now, as I add on applications, every application I actually want to have a separate definition of what policy describes it. So this is an example for the B2C that could have different ports that it opens up or that it wants to drop. And I have a different definition for stock application. Yeah. Finally, there is also some bottom list that says anything that is not allowed is, for instance, a drop. Yeah. Now, this whole list has to be compiled and would have to be applied out on every hypervisor that hosts a VM that runs in this test environment. Right? So it is a process that runs in the background, but essentially the whole definition of this policy can happen up front. You can save it. You can manage it in your configuration management tools. And you can take it from one location to another location. You can also use it to, for instance, do, to do backouts or rollbacks. So suppose you have an issue in your production environment. You can actually take the policy that is valid at that moment. You can take it out. You can roll it back. You can roll, apply it in your test environment. So you kind of have a direct replication of your current network topology and your policy, put it in place in your test infrastructure, make sure you understand what the behavior should be, fine tune it again, and then reapply it, for instance. There are some hidden slides here. So, um, so this was a bit about abstraction and velocity, right? The next thing we want to address is how, what type of flexibility um, we see that people want to have to, de to deploy firewalls, to deploy load balancers, or to set up a VPN as a service. Obviously, the default option when you're using OpenStack 
is to use what comes out of the box. Firewall as a service, load balancer as a service, VPN as a service. The way how that is deployed is effectively you have a network node. And in there, there are certain namespaces where you have your HA proxy running, or you have your north-south firewall, or your VPN service. Yeah. Now, this is a software implementation. It's automated. But if you look in an enterprise environment, it could be that they want to use a different model. They may want to use an existing firewall or an existing load balancer. And what we effectively enable with New Irish Networks is to also connect up those centralized appliances through our gateway. It can be still a software gateway. It could be a hardware gateway. But effectively, you want to ensure that the context or the virtual firewalls or the virtual context that you're defining in your load balancers, that they are um, tied up in the networking configuration of your tenant. So essentially, in this example, if you have, like for instance, a tenant network, the green one, you want to make sure that it links into the virtual context of the physical firewall or load balancer. And we did some of that integration for, um, with F5, um, with Palo Alto as well on the, on the firewall side. And what we're using to, in the OpenStack side to model this connectivity between um, the tenant network and the network or the VLANs on the physical load balancer firewall is a provider networks. There is also a project defined um, under layer two gateway which effectively makes it a bit easier and we can make a direct mapping. And that's something that we see coming up in Kilo or in Liberty. So this is centralized, non-virtualized. Now, as innovation kicks in, we obviously want to distribute our network functions. So distributing network functions means that it's not anymore centralized in a network node, but I can start distributing, for instance, my load balancer function. And the example here is that here, I don't actually need any more a network node because my function is being distributed. And effectively, I'm still using the load balancer as a service um, module to deploy a new load balancer for a particular tenant to configure the pools, to configure the VIP. But the instantiation of that load balancer function happens in a very distributed fashion. So here, the example that we are developed is together with Avi Networks. It's something that you can also see in our booth later on, or I think it's in their booth this afternoon, quarter past four, and we see this system end-to-end -end working. Last option is actually to look at the at the firewall side of things, or where we're actually seeing a more a push to also use a distributed agent framework that is multi-tenant. Yeah, so essentially what we then allow is that an agent, a network agent, is running alongside our OVS or our VRS inside every compute host that can inspect the traffic. And in case something happens or if something special has to happen with that traffic, that we can actually maybe drop it, maybe redirect it, at least do something special with it. Yeah? These agents, we see them under the form of a VM, could be under the form just of a process or a container or a Docker. Right? The type of functions that we see sitting in that type of agent, um, we've implemented a few by Nuage itself. There's like the proxy ARP or DHCP function. So effectively, you capture the HTTP. It's a local agent that would answer there. It's not like being centralized anymore. The same thing with metadata agent, the metadata service. We're also doing um, the storage proxy for Swift. So for instance, if you want to access storage, you're effectively going to capture that request. And instead of going in an overlay network to go to your um, storage, you can actually break it out and directly access it from the hypervisor, so by an agent. Or you can apply more security-related functions, layer 5 to layer 7 work. Right? So I think overall, what you see here is that there is a number of options that you have to connect up access as a service. It's up to whenever you deploy your OpenStack environment, have a look to that and consider what works best in your environment.
Now, lastly, we also want to see a little bit about how we can connect clouds to other sites. And where we come from is that um, typically we see like larger financials, actually a lot of enterprise, I mean, any industry, they wouldn't just have one data center, they would have multiple. And the question is what you do with like your application that are sitting across those data centers. Um, do you replicate all your infrastructure across the two and do you manage them very separately? Or do you try to at least have some kind of synchronization between them, some kind of replication, so at least some of your own burden is taken away and that things are happening behind the scenes that are making sure that either users or networking are getting synchronized or accessible from other sites. And this is exactly the use case we're working on from a networking perspective. On the user side of things, that is actually something we get with Kilo, and actually before already a bit, with Identity Federation. Now on the networking side, um, there you have to think, how can I also federate my network? Is there a possibility that I can access my resources that are sitting in another site? Can a VM that sits in site one, can it ping a VM in site two or in a public cloud without having to go over a breakout gateway without having to go over a VPN particular service. Actually, would I be able to define a service that stretches across those networks? And can I define a subnet in my other site that still uses the same routing instance and my first in my primary site, for instance? And can I even define, for example, a security group or a policy that takes in resources from site one and site three and considers them as like one, considers them all as, for instance, these are database servers, and can I have one policy that says, nobody can access database servers except for this particular firewall, for instance. So this is the type of problem space that we wanted to work in and that we are trying to solve with Nuage. And we actually enabled that um, since our first release two years ago by allowing to have a centralized policy engine to deploy that and to control Nuage, in, to control the networking in every site with, um, a new, with our Nuage plugin. What that means is that I can indeed have a network that stretches across multiple OpenStack instances. I can have the layer two subnet that stretches across. I can have a single routing instance that routes between site one, site two, and a public cloud. And I can really go into my open my Nuage engine and see, hey, these are all my VMs, and this is my network topology, and I can map them into every OpenStack environment. Now, we also saw that this topology is something that it's great, but people sometimes want to make sure that there is no shared infrastructure between those sites. They really want to make sure that from top to bottom, from their provisioning stack down to the data path, everything gets replicated. So that they get absolute independence between site one and site two. Now, what we therefore allow is something that we call a federation of a policy. And in this particular deployment, we would effectively deploy the Nuage VSD, the Nuage directory, in every site. The local directory, the local policy engine, is then responsible to resolve your local network requests. But in case you have a stretched network, in case you want to access a resource from a remote site, at the time of startup of your VM, it would actually contact the home VSD. It would contact the main VSD to ask, what is now my policy? What is now the, the networks I need to talk to? What are my security policies that I need to comply with. And this is something that uh, we would call federated policy. In both models, in this one and that one, I actually now able to stretch my subnets. I can have subnets created in a public environment that can attach to a private instance. I can have VMs that communicate between them. 
and I can have my security policies across sites. So I think overall, it's like thumbs up. We actually can establish multi-clouds distributed. They can all talk to each other using one network policy. And that's effectively how we have realized the picture that you saw in the beginning, where we've seen a stretched cloud ranging across Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific. So overall, let's um, go to conclusions. We have a number of needs that we have identified in the very beginning here. We got an abstraction that we need. Make sure networks get consumable. And what you actually saw here is that we can solve some of that by applying, by being able to define network policies that are defined on an s need basis. We got scalability. Scalability is something, I mean, we can talk. I mean, we run actually a lot of our tests. There are some videos we can share with you. We run a lot of our scalability tests actually in Amazon. In Amazon, we run them with containers um, because it's containers in VMs. And we can start up them in a very easy fashion. And we run those scalability tests ranging from 20K containers now up to 100K containers. And we kind of see that um, to ramp them all up, it actually takes us an order of magnitude of minutes. And the reason why we can do this so fast is because we have a distributed control plane that is going to calculate how all these containers are going to have to talk to each other, what network is needed to tie them up all together. This is basically the reason why we believe we have a very scalable solution. I was also showing you some of the flexibility that we enable. If you move your cloud forward and you start thinking about services like VPN, load balancer, firewalls, you may have different desires than others. And so you need to have that flexibility to connect them all up. And lastly, I was showing you how we actually can federate the network across multiple sites. Yeah. With that, we want to thank you for your time here. And we would like to open up here for questions. So the demo that Jonas was talking about, which is actually showing the reference architecture that we had up on the screen earlier, is being shown at the RV Networks booth, T9, at 4.15 this afternoon. So if you want to have a look at that in operation, and that's actually implemented in, um, in, our, uh, in our customer data centers across, um, ac across different locations, you can see that in operation. Um, but if you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to, to answer them for you. Yes, we will, yep. absolutely. So, uh, so in your network federation model, the assumption seems to be that the public cloud and private cloud are all managed by newer controller. But in the reality, when customers want to create a network with hybrid cloud, with Amazon cloud or Google cloud, how do you achieve network federation? So we enable uh, any workload on any public cloud environment by a software-based virtual route switch that sits on a VM. So therefore, unlike many other vendors, you don't need access to the underlying hypervisor in that scenario, and you don't need any other hardware or software in the back end of that cloud provider. So then that VRSG module, which is the virtual route switch module, can then bring in all that information from say the core data center in your private cloud as an example. Or in fact, you could, um, as we have done with SoftLayer, run the entire solution in SoftLayer as it's all software based. It actually um, gives us some other benefits as well because I mean, typically in a public cloud there are quite some restrictions in terms of the networking you can build up there. You can't, I mean, it's very difficult to assign multiple IPs, have a lot of VNICs even run some layer two multicasts is typically blocked. So by effectively deploying our virtual switch on a VM and have, for instance, containerized workloads, we're actually overcoming some of these limitations that you see in public clouds. And that's been one of the key <coughs> arguments why people are looking to effectively deploy the Nash V switch in that public cloud environment. The other advantage as well is you, 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 you're assimilating your APIs. So as a developer, you can be writing to a single set of APIs in any environment, whether it's your private cloud, 
your existing data centre or public cloud. Now, obviously, with our plug-in with OpenStack, that further enhances that. So we see a like for like with, with the two APIs there. Any other questions? That's so that definitely a use case you can implement can with that, yeah? I have, I have a few OpenStack projects, and yeah. Yeah, all of them, I have several database servers that I want all of them to always share, uh, inherit a few uh, policies. So that Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, the, the only requirement is that you're using the Nuage plugin for each of those OpenStack uh, cloud environments. But So our OpenStack plugin interacts with the, the default OpenStack security groups. So when, when you first configure it, you can decide whether you want OpenStack to be the master, if you will, or, or Nuage to be the master, and then it flows through depending on how you... I mean, so to be honest, I mean, there is a number of the advanced network topologies that are just not... I mean, that you're just not capable of modeling in OpenStack at the very minute. So for those more advanced network topologies, yeah, You'd have to make your network topology in Nuage, right? You make your subnets, you say, hey, these, these are the things that need to be stretched. These are your, that one policy, I want to make sure it's applied everywhere. And then I'm actually mapping your network topologies or your subnets in the OpenStack instances that you want to bind it to. Yeah. It's something that, um, I mean, is used in most of our MVA or customer cases like that, by the way. Any other question? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>